Hey guys, Noah here with Learn Meta Analysis, and in this video, we are going to be running our overall meta analysis. We're going to be interpreting the results, and we are going to create a forest plot. Last but not least, we are going to check for outliers and influence. So, as you are watching this video, I am assuming that you have already calculated your effect sizes for all of your data points. So if you haven't done that, please go back and watch the previous video. From here, we're going to assume we are at that point. Our data is loaded into R already, and we are ready to actually run our meta-analysis. Now, we are going to do a random effects conventional meta-analysis. Okay, so let's start here at the top. Analyses. So first and foremost, we want to run our overall random effects meta-analysis. So the first thing that I do is I need to name this item. I'm going to call it overall result, and I'm going to call it that because it is very easy for me to remember, right? And ultimately, I want to be able to remember these things easily. So I'm going to call it overall result. So what command am I going to actually give the system? Well, I am going to tell Metaphor, I want you to use the function RMA, so random effects meta-analysis. Uh, and then we have a number of different uh, arguments that we can make. So I'm telling it, by using yi, I'm telling it, I want you to use the effect size. The effect size is labeled in my data set as yi. The second one is asking for the variance for the effect size. I am saying, well, this is called vi. Then when I, I'm saying, I want you to use the data set dat1, which is what we used earlier. So let's run this real quick and see what happens. Okay. When we run that, you can see down here, just like before, it says, okay, we ran this code, but that's not super helpful, right? You wanna know the actual result. And over here on the right, you can see that it's displayed. And if you open this, you can see, oh, just a whole bunch of numbers. Um, so what we'll do is we'll ask it to display the overall result. And the way we do that is we just type in the name of the item and then we run it. Okay, so now we have something we can work with here, right? So let's break down these results one by one. So first and foremost, we can see we use the random effects model. It tells us that. We can see we had 27 studies. And we can see that to estimate tau squared, it used REML, which is good. That's what we're going to use. So let's look at the overall model result first, and then we'll go back and talk a little bit about heterogeneity. So down here under estimate, we have our effect size. Our effect size was 0.6142. So what do we know? Well, this is a standardized mean difference effect size, or hedges G. So we can interpret this similarly to how we would interpret a Cohen's D, where 0.6 would be considered moderate. All right, so what do we have next? We have our standard error. That's good for us to know. We have our Z value, good for us to know. And we have our P value. This is probably what we're really, really interested in the moment is, is this overall effect size from our meta-analysis actually statistically significant or not? In this case, it is. We can also see we have our lower bound of our confidence interval and our upper bound of our confidence interval. So this is all data that we would actually want to report if we were reporting this in a manuscript. So we would say our overall meta-analysis of 27 effect sizes uh, produced a result of this, g equals 0.61 with a p-value of less than 0 0.0001. And the confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval for this was 0.39 to 0.83. Okay, so we got our overall effect size here, but now we need to talk about heterogeneity and really understand what that means and what it tells us, because we have a lot of numbers here. So let's break them down one by one. The first thing that we tend to look at, or at least that I tend to look at, is the test for heterogeneity, which is the Q test. This is essentially asking if there's significant heterogeneity in the sample. So is it more than random chance alone? And if P is less than 0.05, the answer is yes. And you can see here, the answer is, like the p-value is less than 0.05. So there is significant heterogeneity in our sample. Okay, in my brain, that's one check mark. That's something I need to make sure I report in my paper. And it's also letting me know that I'm probably going to want to run a moderator analysis for moderators that I've coded. So now that I'm here, I say, okay, what do I want to look at next? Well, next, I want to look at the I squared value. So we can see the I squared value is here in this block. I'm going to highlight it for us. So let's think about what is I squared. I squared is telling us how much variation is due to true heterogeneity. And we can see that we have 73.51%. Okay, and if we remember our, from the concepts videos, 50 to 75% is considered substantial, 75 to 100 is considered considerable. So this is somewhere right in between that substantial and considerable range. So this is pretty high. So again, we're thinking, okay, maybe we have a reason to do moderator analysis. Now, last but not least, 
let's talk about tau, tau squared because people don't talk about tau squared too much in educational meta-analyses, but I think we should. So with tau squared, we are essentially looking at the estimate of variance of the true effect. So this is only between study heterogeneity. And this number here can be interpreted as an effect size, like in the same way as our effect size is. So we use standardized mean difference, so we can think about this as a standardized mean difference. So this is the variance from between study heterogeneity. So we're going to record this as well. Um, this is something that's good for us to know, and we should report it in our paper, or at least consider reporting it in our paper. Okay, so these findings in hand, what do we do next? Well, the next thing that you probably want to do at this stage is calculate your forest plot. So let's go ahead and do that. You can see we have forest plot code here. So we're going to say forest.rma. That is the uh, function within metaphor. So we're going to create a forest plot for an RMA function. And you can see up above when I hover over it like this, it tells us essentially what arguments are there. But we're going to ignore that for now. So the first thing that we're going to tell it is what result or what data piece do we want to use. I like to think of it, think of it as data pieces, even though it is technically a result. So uh, when I say a data piece, I'm referring to what's over here in my environment. And I know that in my environment, I call my overall meta-analysis result overall result. And this is part of the reason I do this is so it's easy for me to remember. But anyway, the first thing is we're saying we want you to use the overall result as our as our data when creating this plot. The second thing that we ask is what are we going to call our study labels? That's called S lab or slab. And we're going to tell it what to use. So we're going to say look in our dat1 data set. So if you remember, this was our original data set that we uploaded and we added our effect sizes to. We use the dollar sign to specify a specific column, and the specific column that lists the names of the authors was called study author. So if we want to double check that, we can go over here on the right, and we can see when we open up our dat1 item, my first column that I actually had was called study author, and this is where I listed the names of each author. Last but not least, we have this header argument, and basically what this is doing is putting a label at the top of the force plot and i'll show you what that looks like in a minute when we get there so let's go ahead and run this command okay oh beautiful so over here on the right hand side under plots you can see that this brought up our wonderful little forest plot here and you can see that it has everything properly labeled so uh, earlier I mentioned that we had that header argument, right? And we said study. What that did is that put that label up here at the top where it says study. And it also added this standardized mean difference so that we know what this is. And it added the 95% confidence interval as our header to this table. So you can see we have our individual studies listed here on the left. This corresponds to the rows in our data set. Then we have our effect size and the confidence interval for the effect size for each study that was analyzed. Down here, zero is marked by this dashed line. Our overall meta-analytic effect size and confidence interval is down here. It's this uh, little diamond that you can see. Last but not least, we have the effect size from each study listed here. And we have the 95% confidence interval listed here. And you can see that it actually gives us this in a quantitative way down here at the bottom right. So. That gets us through running our meta, our running our random effects meta analysis, looking at heterogeneity, and building our force plot. Okay, so now let's take a look at influence. And we basically what we want to know is we have these results, but do we want to rely on these results, or maybe we have some outliers or some studies that are overly influential? So let's do one last analysis here before we move on. So with a conventional model, this is very very easy. There's a function in metaphor called influence. So all we do is type influence and then tell it what data item we want to use. We want to look at the influence within our overall result. So we can just highlight this and we hit run. All right, and what do we get? We got a bunch of stuff here, right? So look at this, we have our students and then a bunch of other different data points. But one of the wonderful things about metaphor is this final column that says inf for influence and you'll see most of them do not have an asterisk but this one sure does so what does this mean this means that something along the lines one of these tests in here was significant so what does this mean practically right that means we might have an outlier we might have a study with significant influence so we should look at what our ninth study was we open this up oh i'm sorry so the easiest way to do this is to actually go back to our data set so i'm going to open that up and pull it open here Okay, so our ninth study, which would be this row. So if we look here, 
what this would tell us is if I was actually doing a meta-analysis on this data is I would want to go back and re-examine this ninth study and see what does this what does this have going on? Do I have a data entry error? Um, like, is everything accurate? That's always the first thing I check. Was my data entry actually accurate? Because it's very, very, very simple to have a decimal point in the wrong place or accidentally hit like a nine instead of a six or something like that. So I always go back and check my data entry first. Assuming my data entry is okay, the next thing I do is I look at the study itself and I think, is there anything about this that would rationalize removing it? Like, is it notably different than any of the other studies that we have? If the answer is yes, then that leads you to a decision point. Do you want to modify the effect size? Do you want to remove the effect size? Or do you want to leave it be? That's a personal decision. Now, let's say it's not notably different. Well, if it's not notably different than the other studies, my personal opinion right now is to leave it be because in my mind, it's a valid effect size. Um, other people may disagree. It's I should say, I, I like to think about it right now anyway, in 2024, it's quite common to uh, change that effect size and move it closer to the other, so it's not so much of an outlier. But the other thing that we need to think about is which actual statistic was significant there. Is it because it was an outlier or is it because it was influential, right? And th that's a very important distinction because if something is an outlier or something is influential, it has different implications for one. So. Typically, if something is an outlier, I like, and there's nothing wrong with the study, I like to leave it be. I don't typically change it. At least that's my opinion right now. Now, if something is influential, and I really do a very close analysis to see why, in many cases with data sets I've worked with so far, it's, be, it's been because that study has a notably larger sample size than others. And you can see that's not the case here, right? In this, in this particular example that we have, the sample size is 24 and 29, which is consistent with others. But imagine that this was, you know, 300 in each group. Well, that would explain why it's an influential study, right? Or it could at least partially explain it. It has a much larger sample size than others do in this group. So for the purposes of our arguments right now, we are going to leave our data set alone. But if you come to this point and you realize that, hey, I need to make a change. Maybe you want to remove an effect size because it's significantly influential and it's, it's very different than others in the analysis. Or maybe you just want to downgrade an effect size, move it closer to the others because it's an outlier, but you want to keep it in your study. Whatever the rationale, if you're going to change your data, you need to go back and rerun everything we've done so far. But you need to report this. Right? You need to report that you've done this in your actual meta-analysis itself. So that is why I run my meta-analysis, see what the result is. Uh, honestly, I typically don't do my forest plot until after I do my outlier and influence analysis. I just put it here for the sake of contiguity with uh, demonstrating this video, but you can do it uh, anytime after you calculate your overall result. So I my process is typically run my analysis and then check for influence. And I really don't even look at my overall analysis until after I've checked for influence because if something is different, like if I need to change something because of the influence analyses, then this overall result is going to get rerun with the new data anyway. But for the purposes of this, we're going to assume that everything is fine. We're going to say that study is what we would consider a valid study. It's similar to the others. They just legitimately found an effect size that's different than the others in the group. And we're okay with that. We're, we're okay with that. We're still going to say in our paper that this study had significant influence and we chose to leave it the same because it was not significantly different than others. So in our next video, we are going to talk about categorical moderator analysis. Thank you guys and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video.